Drones are almost certainly the future of delivery, but that future might be here a little quicker than we think. A drone cargo airline just received a license to operate in Europe. Hello and welcome to Tech First. My name is John Kutsir. Most drone delivery startups that I've talked about and written about are focused on last mile delivery, small packages, short distances, and bringing a coffee to somebody or a book or maybe a laptop or something like that. One, however, has plans to become a full-blown cargo airline. All its aircrafts are all its aircraft are drones, but they're not the kind that you fit in your hand. These ones carry almost 800 pounds, over 1,500 miles. They do so 50% cheaper with 60% fewer emissions and 80% faster than standard air freight. Here to chat is CEO and co-founder Svillen Rangeloff. Welcome, Svillen. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Pumped to have you. Talk about Black Swan, your aircraft. The Black Swan is essentially a fixed-wing drone. Uh, it's 50 feet wingspan, 25 feet long. It has a payload of around 770 pounds or about 350 kilograms and can go as far as 1,550 miles or about 2,500 kilometers. It's essentially the size of a two-seater general aviation, two-seater airplane, right? And it can land on very short runways around 400 meters or 1,300 feet, and they don't even need to be paved. So... It's essentially like a bush plane, but wow. uh, the cockpit stays on the ground, and so it's all cargo inside. Are you building this from scratch? Are you using another aircraft as the basis of it? How are you manufacturing? We're building this from scratch. We are, it's a clean sheet design, and the reason for that is we looked, even before we started the company, and that was nine years ago, people had already put autopilots on small Cessnas and uh, other aircraft. The, the the problem with that is that you in, inherit all the design decisions for airplanes that were meant to have humans on board. A lot more parts, a lot more complexity, um, different materials, different maintenance schedules, different shapes. So it, it's we figured out it's so unnatural to fly that you need to be super optimized for the one thing that you're supposed to do. And in our case, uh, we decided the one thing we would do is to carry goods and therefore, we needed a completely new kind of design so that we can extract any possible efficiency from any possible place. Is it a prop? Is it a jet? It's a prop. We use an existing engine made by Rotax. So it's a prop, 140 horsepower, four cylinders, internal combustion engine, uses regular gasoline, but also interestingly can work with 100% synthetic gasoline. And we're also experimenting with hydrogen and so on because sustainability is super important for us. Why is it so much uh, less polluting and cheaper? Is it that you don't have to put a, a cockpit in there, fly a pilot? Can it be much more aerodynamic? There's several things. First, because it's a custom design, we've optimized for, the, for exactly the type of goods that we're going to be carrying. So in the history of av aviation, Almost every single airplane that was ever designed was made for humans first. And then cargo was always like, well, maybe we'll rip out the, the seats and see how much we can fit inside. Here, we've built the aircraft around the cargo. And we also were able to use design techniques to make sure that the, it has a lot higher lift than typical. Essentially, we create a very fuel efficient aircraft not only from the sustainability priority, but also from the just operating cost priority, because ultimately cargo customers, they're very price sensitive as well. And then there's the actual place of this in the supply chain. Typically, you have very big airplanes that get offloaded onto very big trucks, but that very big truck doesn't stop in front of your home and ring your doorbell. It makes an additional handover to a last mile vehicle. So... The reason why we sized the aircraft to be able to carry around 800 pounds or 350 kilos is because that's the payload of one of those last mile cars that are like the panel vans, like Volkswagen Caddy or Renault Kangoo. And, and those are the most popular last mile vehicles around the world. So when you're using us, you're probably skipping steps in the supply chain as well. So goods are not moving all these useless kilometers. They're going a lot in a lot more direct fashion. So all these factors end up contributing to much lower emissions, 60%, even when we use gasoline. 
and up to 100% when we use SAF and hydrogen. Super interesting. So you seem to be designing for a dedicated payload for a single customer, or is this also usable if you just need to get goods from A to B and from B it goes out to 10 or 15 or 20 different places? We're starting with single customer uh, per flight and our operating model is um, precise that we're operating as an airline, so we're not selling the drones. So. Each uh, flight will be dedicated to a particular customer with whom we would have these block space agreements or long-term commitments for particular frequencies on a particular route. Now, in as we get um, more used to the operations, we'll be able to do consolidations of different customers on the same flight, uh, but that's phase two. What kind of customers need this sort of thing? Are you talking about remote work sites? Are you talking factories, retail? Yeah, the low hanging fruit definitely is in high value goods or so time critical shipments. A lot of that could be spare parts within the industry. So, for example, your production line breaks down. It can easily cost six digits or higher per hour if you don't get it back up and running. And, and then there's obviously pharmaceuticals, medical. We'll, we'll be doing uh, a trial next year in the UK, in Scotland, as part of a consortium for the NHS there. And and yet, because of the unit economics our aircraft is able to achieve, we're even relevant for a lot of the lower value goods and a lot of high frequency purchases, e-commerce, and so on. And that's really the true breakthrough in uh, our innovation. Because a lot of people can make a very expensive airplane. Very few can make a very cost-effective airplane. Talk about some of the safety factors. You've got an autonomous drone here, basically. I don't know if it's autonomous, actually. Maybe it's fly-by-wire. Let's talk about that. But you've got a, a drone aircraft that's flying around. It's fairly decent size. It's got fuel on board. It might have cargo on board. It's dangerous if this thing gets out of control, crashes somewhere, or maybe even gets taken over by some hacker. How does it, what are the safety factors here? Yeah, so we're a lot like like any other airline. And the reason why aviation is the safest mode of transportation is because it uses very well-proven systems and, and guidances to get the job done. So we use a lot of redundancies in everything. The, the drones are always within control of humans. So we have an autopilot on board, but we always have human operators who are actually commercially trained pilots that are in charge. We have two pilots at the origin, two pilots at the destination. So instead of one cockpit per vehicle, we have one cockpit per location. We only fly between existing airfields. So again, these are secure areas and so on. And we have multiple means of communication. So again, there's just a multi-layered approach to ensuring the safety. And that's part of how we were able to achieve the license that we got. I never really imagined that pilot would be one of those jobs that you could do remotely. <laughs> do for a moment. Of course, we have drones that have been operating for a long time, the U.S. military. So I should have thought of that. But that is interesting. Is there a one-to-one -one correlation between pilot and craft? Or can one pilot manage and control five or ten or three? So even before we started, there's been academic research out there that demonstrates that you can have one operator safely manage 10 to 15 flights. Now, in our case, it's a lot simpler than the military, right? Because we're talking about routes that are predefined, prearranged with the regulators. They're mm -hmm. like a scheduled airline, right? So the more deterministic it is, the more the easier it gets to plan and to operate. We will be, as phase two, looking into on-demand applications, but again, they will be on those preset routes. Then... Yeah, it's just going to be a, a situation where you're going to have two pilots initially at origin taking care of one flight for the first 15 minutes doing the taxiing, the takeoff, and the initial pre-programming of the autopilot. And then two pilots at the destination for taking charge of, of the landing, taxiing, and takeoff. Technology can do a lot of that itself, but we always want to have humans in the loop, humans in control. And then we have also a third group of pilots who are in the network of center who sit in this centralized location for the whole country for the whole continent that they have overview of where 
every flight is going and they can intervene if there's an issue. So in fact, we start with a lot more than one per flight, but as we scale, it, it gets to be reversed. Interesting. I can't wait for this brave new future where we've got an autonomous drone carrying stuff all over the country, all over the continent. It gets down, probably a robot will unload it, and these mini drones will take all the packages and distribute them. You've raised $40 million. One of your investors is the EU itself. You have a license now. What are the next steps? Yeah, so we're finishing the flight testing program towards the end of the year, and then after that, we'll be able to start commercial operations. It's quite exciting because we'll be able to start a couple of years earlier than than others. And then we'll start flights in Greece first and then expand through the rest of the Mediterranean, as well as the UAE, Australia and other markets. I can see Greece being quite interesting. A lot of islands, so challenges for delivery. Exactly, yeah. We're starting with low-risk routes, so flights over water predominantly. And then we really... Everything we do is in a crow walk run approach. So as we gain the experience, we'll be able to expand more routes, more flights, more territory, and so on. Very cool. Talk about future aircraft that you are thinking of. You mentioned alternative fuels. I think you're looking at an entirely EV or electric solution as well. Well, the challenge we've always had with pure electric was not the propulsion, but the batteries. Motors mm-hmm. can be a lot simpler, lighter easier to maintain and longer lasting than internal combustion, but batteries, current battery technology is still 40 times worse energy density than fossil fuels. And then there's also the supply chain, right? This type of aircraft and this type of solution will make the most difference in, in the most challenging markets where electricity is not a given everywhere. In a lot of places, you end up charging batteries by pouring fossil fuels into a generator. So we need to be honest about that. I think that's why we designed the aircraft to be very modular. So when it comes to synthetics, there's no uh, modifications we need to do. We we are partnering with companies on provision of SAF. So it's just a matter of do they have the supply at the locations where we'll be operating at. And then when it comes to, for example, hydrogen, you can talk either about gaseous or which will have minor modification or fuel cells where you have a little bigger modification, but the airframe doesn't need the nose section. It can take many different kind of engine engines and motors. And then we can we've left enough space in the aircraft to to make those modifications in a painless way. So we've tried to make it as versatile as possible. Very cool. You probably have your hands full on uh, the continent of Europe, but any eyes towards North America? Yeah, so we're quite excited. We we think there's a, a real path to doing some initial trials in the US around this time next year, and then eventually roll out in the US in 2025. Of course, we're, we're working closely with regulators in a number of countries. Again, this is not the solution for, I don't know, Frankfurt to Heathrow, right? Or O'Hare to JFK. This is rather to connect bigger centers of commerce to tier two, tier three cities and Downs or just connecting those tier two, tier three directly instead of wasting time and fuel to go through some bigger hubs. So there's quite a lot of markets in, in the US, Canada, very big and very diverse geographies with a lot of applications. So we're definitely looking forward to coming there as well. Super cool. I can see a lot of application. There's a lot of territory over here. And it makes sense as well in many nations in Europe as well. We talked about Greece and the islands and challenges there. Italy, all the population going to the cities. Now you can go out and disperse to those towns where you can get ancient villa for one euro or something like that and <laughs> get exactly. all your goods and services locally. No, exactly. Yeah. So COVID made it acceptable to be working and moving bits remotely. But uh, when it comes to atoms, that's still to be solved, and we hope to be part of that solution. So, yeah, I, I think if you, if you look at population projections, but before the end of the century, we'll have cities that have 100 million people. I don't know many people that enjoy living in 10 million people cities, right? The first thing people, uh, when they advance in their career and so on, and uh, any any chance they get, they actually move out of the city to live in the countryside, right? And you saw that during the pandemic as well. 
So uh, yeah, this trend of urbanization that's been going on for 70 years, um, a lot of that has to do with the lack of infrastructure in so many other places. So if we can contribute to that infrastructure, we can help alleviate some of that um, pain. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much.